uh, we're going to be continuing on our creative series this week, like John mentioned, and that's actually going to go one additional week. So I was thinking we'd be wrapped up by today. Uh, but last week I was preaching for the recording. I think I mentioned this and I was at 43 minutes in and, you know, our average YouTube stats at this point suggest that people are watching for about 20 to 23 minutes. Uh, so I'd lost them about 20 minutes ago anyways. And I just figured might as well just roll some of this into next week. And really the Lord start to, started to unpack and show me some more that we can kind of land this plane on the creative minority thought that we've been in the last few weeks. And so Today we're going to continue it with looking at time and excellence. If you've missed the last few weeks, I don't have time to do an exhaustive kind of recap, but we've looked at really what it means to be, if you could kind of circle it thematically around one idea, it's how to live in a life of exile. And that right now, uh, modern day America in 2020, what we're sitting in is, is a lot like thematically the biblical theme of exile. And so we've been looking at Daniel and, and how he has lived out his life, the marching orders that were given to him by Jeremiah. Because when Daniel is captured, him and his friends are taken out of Jerusalem, planted in Babylon. They're now living in a kingdom that does not reflect or represent or embrace their ideologies or values as a people. And yet they're placed in Babylon and Jeremiah is not like, all right, listen, this is how you're going to take over. You're going to do this. And you're going to get in there with the king's palace and then you're going to kill him and then you're going to take over. And that's just not that way it goes. He says, hey, uh, get comfy. Like you're going to, build, you're going to be there a while. Plant, plant a garden, build a house, build a family, make something there. Bless the city, pray for the city because in the city's welfare, seek the welfare of the city because in that welfare of the city that you're living in, even though it doesn't embrace who you are, it doesn't live out like you would live out in the city's welfare, you will find welfare. That's how Jeremiah encourages Daniel and his friends. And, and Daniel at that time, it's really, it's kind of hard to believe, but he's like 15, 16, 17, 18 years old at the time. So how many students we got in the room? You're right around that age. Would you just slip your hand up? Come on, lay off a few of you, a few of you. Like, do, are you realizing, I hope you realize in this book that like Daniel, he's surrounded by the temptations of the kingdom. Like he's tempted to participate in the king's eating and the king's drinking and all the things that come with this royalty, but he resolves in his heart at a young age not to defile himself. And he has this commitment to the Lord where he's like, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna compromise on these different things. I'm gonna be committed to him. And then what we're gonna read in Daniel chapter six today is some 50 plus years later. So Daniel in the lion's den is getting tossed into the den with hungry lions at the age of 70 to 80 years old. Come on, anyone 70, 80 years old right now, you ready to go? Ready to roll up in the lion's den? Like, let's go. That's, that's where he's at in his life. And so his life's been marked now by this commitment over a long period of time to Jesus and to practicing who Jesus has called him to be living in exile. And, and we've looked at different things that I think one of the most naive approaches we can take in modern day Christianity is to think that coming to church on one Sunday for an hour and maybe you come every week. Most people don't, but to be honest, like we're more like two times a month, maybe. So but let's just say we're here an hour every week. And we think that we're so naive to believe that in this one hour of formative time together, listening to God's teaching, sitting in his presence during worship, that that can undo the, the hours and hours a week of cultural formation that's taking place over the rest of the week. And so you're just steeped in your newsfeed. You're steeped in the TV programming that you're watching and participating in. You're just, you're immersed into the, into the fabric of this culture at your workplace and different people that you interact with. And we think that we can come to church one Sunday a month, or two Sundays a month, and we can undo all that programming that's happening the rest of the time. And, and so what we decided last week was we said, no, you have to have these counter-formational practices. That culture, we're living in a, in a world that no longer embraces Jesus as king. It, you're not going to naturally just drift your way to church in America these days. Can I get a better amen from somebody out there? Like you're just, it's not going to happen like that. And so what you need to do is you need to say, no, okay, rather than just pray for revival to happen out there, Rather than just me cast my vote in a way that suggests that this policy is going to change the world, I'm going to actually embrace the forming that Christ is going to be doing in me. And I'm going to develop these practices in my heart. I'm going to get in the word. I'm going to spend time in prayer. I'm going to spend time cultivating and practicing generosity. I'm going to fast. I'm going to detach myself from temporary worldly things to say yes to eternal things. And we got to do these things not to earn God's love, because God has chosen you, he's adopted you, he already loves you regardless of your behavior. 
But now what we do is we put these practices in our lives so that we might be built up to be all the more closer and aware of that love that's already readily available to us. So we have these counterformational practices, but it, we also have to carry out and walk in this way that embraces a distinct moral ethic. We talked about this last week as well, that it's not just good enough to take these 10 rules that were etched on stone and say, okay, I'm not going to, I'm not going to commit murder. I'm not going to commit adultery. I'm not going to steal. I'm not going to worship other things. I'm not going to covet my neighbor's dog stuff. You never covet your neighbor's dog. The neighbor's dog is the one that's always driving you crazy. <laughs> but you're not going to covet your neighbor's things. These 10 rules, while they're important and we should be mindful of them, Jesus also teaches us that, it, man, it also matters how you treat people. Absolutely. And you've got to be living in a way that, are, like, are you seeking out to be a peacemaker? Not just someone who says, oh, I'm going to pray for peace, but are you willing to get your hands dirty and make peace in a situation? Are you willing to be merciful even when the person doesn't deserve it? Because God was merciful with you even when you didn't deserve it. Are you willing to extend humility and meekness this position where you go, okay, wait, I have this great strength inside of me, but I'm going to demonstrate great control as I interact in the world around me with love. And, and so that this, these different ways of living, we said this is what it means to be a creative minority. To, and it's this term that we've kind of been unpacking that we go, okay, I'm, I'm not going to just wait for, uh, here's, here's something that's all in our mind right now. There's going to be this Supreme Court justice that maybe gets placed in the Supreme Court. And we might see in our day the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Yes. Amen. Praise the Lord. We might see the protection and the dignity brought back to the unborn human in our nation. That's an amazing thing. We should pray for that. We should also start being pro-life in the way that we live our lives. We should start, be, we should start being pro-life with the single teenage pregnant mom who's freaking out. We should start being pro-life with the way that the elderly are treated in our nation. Like, like the most compelling argument that I think the other side of that equation holds is that, well, yeah, Christians just want to show up and vote and make policy of a nation, but they don't want to get involved in this, the difficult, tough situations of the lives of people that we're living in. And so we need to, we need to step in as a creative minority. We don't, we don't primarily seek power. I'm, I'm good. Like I'm praying, please, that Roe v. Wade would be overturned. Don't misunderstand me. I'm praying that as a nation, we would, we would have these laws that honor and reflect Jesus and who he is and that justice would reign in our country in a way that Jesus would see justice reign. I'm just not going to be doing that detached from God's working in my heart and in the city that he's placed me in. And, and so... Like I think so often the fault of the church can be rather than seeing themselves as this kind of creative minority who seeks to bless and to seeks to problem solve and build and to cultivate a life in the culture that they're living in, in a world that doesn't reflect their values. Like instead of doing that, what we tend to do is we tend to like angrily lament the past culture that we knew from yesteryear. And we go, okay, if, we, you know, like, well, they used to pray in school. We need to bring back prayer in school. And we need to bring back, like, marijuana shouldn't be legal anymore. And, and we need to get rid of uh, the way that they're defining marriage. We need, and we're lamenting how things used to be while we're simultaneously neglecting the present reality of the world we're living in. And we're also neglecting to build the future that God's called us to build. And so that's our, that's our charge. That's what we've been looking at. And so today what I want to do is I want to take some time to unpack two more of these ideas, ways that you can represent the kingdom while not being so blend in, blending in with the culture around you and not escaping from the world around you. But how do I just live my life in a way that goes, man, Jesus is reigning in my heart. We just sang that song, right? Jesus is reigning over it all. He's reigning over me. How do I now express that and exert that in the world that I'm living in? And today what we're going to look at is these two ideas of time and excellence. And so jump in with me, Daniel chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 1. Again, since we last read Daniel, Daniel 1, there's been 50 years, 50 plus years that have passed. There's a new king. No longer is it Belshazzar. It's now Darius who's king. And it says, verse 1, it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps, think of it like governors, okay, to be throughout the whole kingdom. And over them, three high officials, of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps should give an account so that the king might suffer no loss. So the organizational structure of the kingdom now is built in such a way that, that Darius has this kingdom. He appoints these, these governors over different regions, and they then report to these three dudes. Darius, or I'm sorry, Daniel being one of them. 
Now, Daniel distinguishes himself. If you look in the next verse, verse 3, Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. I'm going to argue that that spirit wasn't there. Like he didn't just combust all of a sudden. Now he's got this excellent spirit in him. Like that was in him. That was, that was part of the, the cultivating, part of the building, part of the creating that he was doing. He was doing it with an excellent spirit the whole time. He didn't just start being excellent in chapter 6. He was excellent because he was committed to the Lord. So set, um, he was, had this excellent spirit and the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom, which then incited jealousy. Verse 4. So the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom. But they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. So these guys, these other politicians, they're like, all right, let's get TMZ, let's get the CIA, let's get the FBI, let's bug his phone. Like, let's see if he's got any dirt that we can find on him. And they can't find anything. He was found to be faithful. Who he was in private matched who he was in public. And so they... They then, I can't even hardly believe this next couple of verses, verse five. Then these men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Verse six, then these high officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. The brown's like on their nose immediately. <laughs> All the high officials of the kingdom and the prefects and the satraps and the counselors and the governors are agreed what? Now, politically, that just, it's a picture I just can't really wrap my mind around. All these, all these people agree. What's that like? Anyways, they all agree. They're all in agreement that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition or praise to any God or man for 30 days, except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. So in Babylon, they, they clearly have this form or system structure of government that says as soon as this is signed into place and it's agreed upon by all these government officials and the king himself, it cannot be undone by the king alone. And so they, he writes this thing, he signs it, you read it in the next verse, he signs this into play. And, and what's crazy is that Daniel just doesn't even miss a beat. Like, it's such a savage Daniel moment. Verse 10, when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper room chamber open towards Jerusalem. And he got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. So I would just argue like that, that the reason that all these governors decided that they could get him in this way because, was because they knew that Daniel had a practicing life of prayer. They knew this about Daniel. He was clearly this way when he interacted with all the different people that, no, Daniel, if he takes anything seriously, he takes Jesus seriously. He's serious about prayer. That dude is up in his room all the time praying. That's why they use that as the rule against him. They used that against him because they knew that's something he wasn't going to sacrifice on. And so Daniel, I love this, like he could have just closed the window. He could have just prayed in private. But he was willing to lose his life for the ability to pray in the public sphere. And he immediately, no fear, he just goes and he's, I'm not willing to compromise on this. And he goes and he prays and he gets on his face three times a day and he, and he faces Jerusalem to remember the city that he'd been exiled out of. And clearly he had been formed by that practice over his life. And, and then if you go on from there, you'll see that, uh, you know, he's tossed into the lion's den. And, and it's just that kind of epic moment where King Darius is freaking out because he actually, he loved Daniel and he gets tossed in the lion's den and he's like, he can't sleep that night. So he goes the next morning and he cries out in the dark, empty hole in the ground where the lions would have been. He's like, Daniel, you down there? And he's like, may the king live forever. And you're just like, ah, you freak out, you know, and it's just so awesome. And, and just like that, you saw it. Come on, Sharon. <laughs> come on church is fun amen somebody we can have a good time on Sunday morning I forgot my point what my point was going to be he 
He wasn't willing to go and pray privately. Like it was something he wasn't going to compromise on. He was going to go and he was going to keep seeking the Lord's face. And, and the, the justice system back then in this time and culturally when this is written, uh, you would put people in these like inescapable situations. So you'd put Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. You'd throw Daniel in the lion's den. And if somehow they came out unscathed, it meant that the gods had looked at them in favor and had spared them. And so they were then innocent for the rest of their lives. But if they were, you know, if they were killed, if they were melted in the furnace, if they were eaten by the lions, then they were found guilty, obviously. The gods did not rescue them, so they were clearly guilty. So say what you want about the justice system. It's come a long ways. Amen? <laughs> it's come a long ways. It's getting there. So there's two things, obviously, that we're going to talk about, time and excellence. And so the first one that I want to unpack is the power of time. The power of time. Time is insanely powerful. And historically and typically what we do is we underestimate what we can do in the long run, but we overestimate what we can do in the short run. Let me prove it real quick. How many of you at your house right now have a project that you started and you did not finish? Come on, no shame. All these dudes that are just like, oh man, my wife's going to kill me. You know, <laughs> like, all right, like, how many of you started a project on like a Saturday afternoon? You're like, I got the rest of the day to get this kid's room organized, get these toys put all back together, do all these different things. And you get there, like a, you're like six hours into the project. The mess is way worse than it was in the beginning. And you're like, how am I ever going to put this back together before I got to go to work on Monday morning? Yeah. And clearly none of you, because you're all like sheepishly grinning at me right now. <laughs> but the truth and the reality is, is that while we're simultaneously overestimating what we can do in the short run, we are, we are woefully underestimating the power that we could do in the long run if we just kind of change some habits. I think of myself in high school where my mom was like, if you would just take the extra 10 seconds to put your clothes away rather than throw them on your floor, like you wouldn't have to spend so much time doing laundry. I wouldn't have to, she would say that, right? Because she did the laundry. She's like, I wouldn't have to do so much laundry on the weekends. But we underestimate the power of just like doing things 10 seconds at a time, 20 seconds at a time to put clothes away, to put toys back where they go, because it actually makes this long-term effect, this long-term habit can be changed. Albert Einstein says that compound interest is the most powerful, uh, the most powerful thing ever conceived by man. And, and he gets credit with saying that, whether or not he actually said it, you know, we'll never know. But, but the, what he's getting at is you can do the calculators on your own. If you're young, I would encourage you to go look at this right when you get home, go Google it. Like if you invest the same amount of money from the ages of like 18 to 28 versus doing it at 48 and 58, it can be millions of dollars of difference in compound interest over your life. And all the old people said, bummer. <laughs> right? Like even as I was doing that, I was like, man, babe, we should have started saving sooner. But it's because we... We, we overestimate what we're capable of in a moment, but we don't see the power of the long term. See, because just like compound interest can affect your money profoundly over time, compound interest in a relationship can affect your influence significantly over time. Now, I'm not saying you can't influence people just by meeting them. I mean, you can catch somebody off guard just by a one-off in a coffee shop at some point. But, but the power of profoundly investing in people's lives usually ends up in you having a lot of say in their lives that you become a trusted voice. Uh, there's this study by psycho psychologists that suggests that after 50 hours with somebody, like actual one-on-one -on -one time, spending time, getting to hear their story, talking with them, okay? So not, not just like we all saw each other at work or we were all in a class that one time, but actually like interacting with somebody. It takes about 50 hours. Just, just consider yourself an acquaintance with somebody. It's like, oh, I know them. They're kind of, they're, they're kind of a friend. It takes a 90 to 100 hours for that to turn into, no, I, like they're a friend. Like that's a friend of mine. I've been at their house. I've had dinner. We've had coffee together. They're a friend. It takes about 200 hours, like actual one-on-one -on -one time investing, getting to hear stories, getting to hear a person's heart for you actually to consider yourself a close friend with somebody. And yet in America, the research set suggests that we, we move on average of 12 times in our lives. And so the, the neighborhoods that we're involved in, the, the places, you know, we, we see them as starter homes. We don't see them as a place where we're going to invest in for the long term. And so I'm not really going to get to know all these people in this neighborhood because it's just my starter neighborhood. You know, we're going to move on. Eventually going to get a bigger house. And 12 times, it's 12, like that's a hard way to connect and to relate with your neighbors if we're moving 12 times in our lifetime. And in the average amount of employment, we actually, uh, America, Americans will hold about 12 different full-time jobs in their life. That's what the research would suggest. To employers to say, hey, your, your onboarding program needs to be less than 12 months because you should only plan on having people work with you at your place for four years. 
And so you think about just like the, the difficulty it is to invest in and to pour in coworkers when you're just consistently thinking, this is just my entry level job. I, jo- I only work at Starbucks right now. I'm going to work somewhere else. Like I'm only an accountant right now here. I'm going to eventually do this. And we, you, you are constantly going to the next thing. And, and I'm not in any way trying to villainize like moving or getting a new job. I think there's obviously a time for all of that. I just think the question that we have to consider is, are we recognizing the eternal impact we can make even if my living situation is temporary? Even if my job is temporary, I can be communicating, I could be investing my time, which is precious, into people to make an eternal difference, even if I'm not here for forever. Uh, When we were doing foster care, we learned about this uh, terrible phrase called reactive attachment disorder, where where we are are wired as as the little babies born in this world, we're wired to connect with our parents. And, and reactive attachment disorder in foster care, especially they pay attention to it because if a kid bounces from home to home, if they're tr- removed from a trauma from their house and they move from home to home to home, like it will, that lack of time with the person who's supposed to be investing in you will create in you an inability to connect with, to receive love, to have emotions that, that connect you to people for the rest of your life, potentially without the miracle working power of Jesus. But, but this reactive attachment disorder is just proof that like, man, time is valuable. Like and if you get detached from, if you're removed from that connection with somebody at too young an age, like it, it, can, it can hurt you, it can harm you for the rest of your life. And, and time is your most precious commodity. You don't have much of it. Amen? This is what James says in James chapter four. He says, your life's like a vapor. He says, when do you, yet, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. But time is the only commodity in your life that you can't get back. You can get more money back. You, you lose some things at work. You lose, like you can, you can earn that back. You can work hard. You can double down. You can get that back. You cannot get time back. Once you, once, and, 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 and I think the mistake that we make when we're young is we think we have forever in front of us. But then when we're older, we realize that forever went a lot faster than we ever thought it could. That's at least what I hear, like from all of you that just, that just say like, no, like, 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 you know how many times I bump into somebody and they're just like, man, value your, like this time with your kids, it's so precious, right? Because they recognize the fragility, the, the, like how precious that time is. And so if you, as, if we, as, as a church, as a, as a people living in a foreign land, as we're willing to invest in people, and actually lay aside our calendar to show up and be present in somebody's life? Like you ever just thought to that coworker that like drives you crazy? You ever thought to just take them out to dinner sometime? To just take them, take them out to coffee sometime and just get to know them, hear their story? Like time has a profound effect in people's life. And if you're just willing to show up and be present, it'll take you a lot further than I think we can ever give it credit for. So time is powerful. Like a commitment to the Lord is powerful. Daniel makes a commitment to the Lord at the beginning of Daniel that he's like, I'm not going to defile myself. But what's even more insanely powerful is the fact that he was doing it 50 some odd years later. It's, 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 it's a potent effect on the way you influence other people. So there's time. The, the next one is excellence. So excellence, it says right here in verse 3, that this Daniel became distinguished above, above all other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. Now, like, I think we, we love to, and maybe rightfully so, we should be hard on the younger generations in our nation that, that we can recognize and we can see the tendencies that, that some, some younger people in this, in this uh, like growing up in our nation right now, want all the luxury of hard work without the effort. And we'd call that word entitlement, right? And so I think it's this combination of this sort of self-idolatry that we have going on in our country, where we try and make everything about you, the consumer. We try and say, hey, you know what? You deserve this. You should have that. They should give you this. You earned this. Like all this entitlement language that, that really stems around this problem of the worship of self, if you really break it down. But then I think you kind of mix that in church circles a little bit with this prosperity teaching, it says, if you just had more faith than you would be given, and we try and detach the like, no, you got to work hard for things. And I think that conceptually gives birth to like something in our mind that just says mediocrity is fine. 
Like just do what you got to do and then get out of there. Just like, just pour in just enough. Just show up just enough. Like whatever you just did, that's good enough. Like, listen, you, you need some, you need some R&R time. You need some time on the couch. Like you need to t- some time to watch a game. And I, like, I'm in no way saying that you, are, you don't reach the end of a week and you like shouldn't have a cold water with the boys on a Saturday. <laughs> like, I just think what we've done in some ways is we've developed a poor theology around work. And, and, and if you go back and read the creation story in Genesis, what you'll find is that work actually happened before the fall. And so it's going to happen after the consummation of all things. In heaven, there will be work. Now, work was frustrated by sin entering the world. It was, work was broken. It was fractured in the way that all things were broken and fractured by the fall. But work was present. Adam and Eve were given the land. The, great, the creation mandate that we read was prior to the fall. Go into the world. Cultivate it. Put rule and order and structure to chaos. Go get your hands dirty. Go put things in line. Like take the earth and subdue it. Have dominion. That was given to mankind before the fall happened. And so here we are like just thinking, okay, I'm just going to work X amount of hours per week so that I can chill. Rather than what Paul talks about in his letter to the Colossian church, church, where he says, whatever you do, work heartily. Like I love that. Fall's coming, it just reminds me of Hormel Chili. You know what I mean? Work heartily. (laughs) But really what that word means is like pour your whole self into it. Are you present in your work, in like, in in your heart? Are you present with your full mind? Are you just giving yourself to the things that God has placed you into? God has called you to work and to cultivate in a certain place. Are you pouring out there? And and I think we, we mess this word up, excellence, with perfection sometimes. And we think that we have to do everything perfectly and, and the outcome will be directed by my amount of work. So perfection creates this burden in us to never make a mistake, to always be pouring more in. The outcome's tied to the input. That's what perfect, perfection creates in us is this impossible burden to carry where excellence invites us then to just give everything we have to the places that God has called us and placed us and to let his grace sustain us through the things that we do right and the things that we do wrong. And because God works all things together for the good of those who love him, that even in your biggest mistakes, you're given the opportunity to to learn and to grow and develop and to be refined, develop and be refined. Now, like, I think you can take that perfection argument and you can, you, for some of you, type A's, you love to work, you love to get in. Like, you can't, you can't just measure your work by what you're doing in your office. Can we talk about this? Like your primary area of ministry that's been given to you, the primary area where you're called to cultivate and create a beautiful life is in your home. And so yes, you should be doing your work with excellence, but you should also be building your family with excellence. You should also be loving your spouse with excellence. This excellent spirit was something that was in Daniel. It didn't just, it didn't just all of a sudden appear once he's in leadership, which is what we like to tease ourselves about. Oh, well, if I could just get the promotion, then I'll be excellent. No, now is the time to start being excellent. This excellent spirit was in Daniel. We don't let it become perfection. Perfection is me pouring everything I can into a situation until it's the best that I can be. Excellence is me investing all that I am into where I am called, knowing that grace will fill the gap. This is the beauty of Christian creativity, is that we're, we're invited to pour ourselves into a kingdom, a place, an empire, that doesn't represent or reflect who we necessarily are. And so while I'm all for going out and voting, going out for, you know, asking and praying for these different things to happen in Washington and stuff like that, it just cannot be detached from you and I pouring ourselves into with excellence, giving our time, treating people in a certain way with a distinct ethic, forming ourselves up so that revival starts in my heart first. I'm going to check my heart first. And yes, I'll pray. And yes, I'll ask that these different things happen, but not detached from a life that's marked by longing to see the renewal and the redemption of the things around me in my workplace, in my school, in my home, in a way that glorifies God so that we might see his his life be breathed into the places that we're in. Amen. Amen. So I thought about kind of, okay, how do we land the plane? Because next week what I want to talk about is 
is having a compelling story to tell. Um, I think we'll get into more of kind of the classic creativity, if you will, next week, the more stereotypical creativity. How do we take all these just like raw, unorganized elements and organize them and put them in, together in a way that make things that are beautiful? And so we'll talk about that next week. But I was like, man, how do I, how do I kind of tie this picture together of what we're called to do as a creative minority living in the world we're living in? And, and it didn't come to me until this weekend, but I, I was, every Thursday morning, John Kent and I, uh, some of you may not know Kent, he's our former lead pastor of like 40 years, not quite that long, but a long time. And we just transitioned this year. So I just became the lead pastor back in January, but we still meet because, you know, I'm like, I need help. And uh, like, I'm just like, dude, what in the world is happening right now is most of the time. But um, we sit there at Loveland Coffee and uh, we have 9 a.m. appointment every Thursday morning, pretty much, unless someone's out of town, we're there. So if you want to come on over to Loveland Coffee, say, hey, go for it. Um, but at, at one point, every time we're meeting, uh, the bakery, just a pinch, uh, they're our paid sponsor for today's message. <laughs> I'm joking. Relax, okay? Like, that door opens up to the bakery, and you're just like, oh, dude, like, maybe we should just stop talking about whatever it is that we're talking about. We should just go in there and eat, right? And, and Jesus, in John chapter 6, calls himself the bread of life. In maybe one of the, like, according to American Christianity, maybe one of the most, like, the, the worst sermons ever preached. Because he started that sermon with thousands of followers and he left with 12. And he calls himself the bread of life. He says, hey, the world out there is starving. You're hungry, you're searching for substance somewhere. But I'm the only thing that's going to fill you. And so I asked Serena Terrell, if you know her, to make me a loaf of bread. We just, yeah. Yeah. I, if you don't know Serena, she can cook like nobody's business. And uh, she made this bread one time uh, when we were hanging out with some people. And I was like, this, this bread, it's a jalapeno cheddar bread. It was like jalapenos and cheese all melted up in here. And this bread changed my life. <laughs> I'm, I'm, not even, I'm not even kidding. I broke it open first service and there was like 50 people. It was like the worst COVID prevention strategy ever. It's like, try this bread. Like, <laughs> you live and you learn. Um, so <laughs> this bread, let me, like, come here, Tom. Come on, somebody. Like, if we just open that up like that, uh, you just grab it. Some? Just take a piece. Just grab a, oh, come on, like, <laughs> it's pretty good. It's pretty good. See, sometimes I think what we're doing with Christianity is we're telling the world, I have the best news ever. I have the best bread that I've ever tasted. Stick with me in, this, in the analogy, okay? Lunch is coming. I knew this was mean, like 11.50. I was like, this is just rude. <laughs> with our faith, we go, okay, I have this story that's the best story ever told. And we're putting this amazing, delicious bread into a home that we're trying to build and we're trying to cultivate. and We're trying to make this life, create this life in a way that represents the, how awesome this bread is. And yet for some of us, because your life is marked by not being committed to the Lord. And people look at you and they go, this is just another phase they're in. They're, not, they're pretty flippant. Don't commit to anything. They're in and they're out because you keep showing up late to work all the time, you're not respecting your job, you're not pouring yourself in, because you're not living with a, with a moral ethic that's, that's cohesive and follows itself all the way through your public life and your private life. And, and so we're building this home that looks like, like a, the house in the horror movie, right? Where you're like, I'm, I, okay, I don't care what bread is in there, like I'm not going to do that. That place looks shady. And what we need to try to do, what we're trying to get after in this creative series is ask ourselves, how can I create my life? How can I build my life, my home, my family, my place of employment? How can I cultivate that to look as beautiful as this bread tastes? See, because the, the hope is, is that as a believer, we can say, hey, listen, I've, I've tasted and seen that this bread is everything that you've ever heard it was and more. And hopefully our life reflects in a certain way. Hopefully it's distinguished in a certain way that people go, yeah, you know what? I want to try some. 
because what, you've, what you're doing here, it looks beautiful. Here's what's amazing about the bread of life. That's what's amazing about Jesus. When you actually submit yourself to him, when you give yourself, commit your whole life to him, not just in a way that desires to have him as savior, but in a way that says, I'm gonna be obedient even though, like as you are my Lord, and you give yourself to Jesus, what he starts to do is he starts to get to work in your house. And they see Chip and Joanna Gaines, that whole place. Blow that wall out, clean that room up, put some shiplap over there. And people look at you and they go, wow, no way, this is the same place you were living in before? Like, I, this has changed since, like your life looks different than it used to. I'd like to come in and try some of that bread now. And what's, what's beautiful, if I could just sit on this for like, pull this back one more layer, is that some of you are so convinced that your house is so busted up that you're never gonna be able to make an impact on somebody around you. But the truth is, there's a lot of busted up people out there in the world we're living in. And they see your house with faded paint, lawns unkept, garbage in the front door. And they go, man, this is just like the house I grew up in. You're telling me that, you're telling me my house could look like yours right now? Let me come in there. I wanna try that bread. I have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. And our hope is that we're building a life that reflects the beauty and the profound wonder of how awesome and powerful this bread is, amen? Would you stand up? I'd love to pray with you. encourage every heart in this room right now? Would we not be burdened by perfection, God? But would we be invited into a relationship with you where you transform us? You transform the way we live our lives. You transform the way we desire things. You transform the, the broken parts of us and you make them redeemed and beautiful and whole. God, for the people who are waiting for that, to feel that and to embrace that and to receive that, God, I pray for patience in the middle of this tough season, in the middle of this dry season, I pray that, you'd be, that people would just be steadfast fixing their face towards you. God, I pray that you wouldn't just let us convince ourselves that we're being Christians in the way that we show up and vote in a month, but that we would actually represent and reflect the values, not just on a piece of paper, but on the tablet of our lives, Jesus. Would you help us carry you, your presence, your kingdom, your life, your redemption, your breath, your joy, your hope, your peace into the places that we find ourselves in in this world. In this world. We love you, Lord, and none of it is possible without you. And so we just say, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, fill up your people. Fill up your people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Hey, we love you, church. We'll see you next week.